I have a few friends who are actually younger, even like Gen Z who are starting to take position in government. They have to pass a really difficult exam to get accepted for a government job and they don't get paid much, but they are so passionate and they are all educated in Western school or education system. So they are more progressive and they are not as lured by money as the previous generation. They also come from really well-to-do family. So I'm seeing more and more of that new generation in the government and I hope they can advance further in the political system. So they will bring more transparency that generation will be able to bring a positive impact and positive wave to our next generation of leaders. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Ao, venture capitalist, serial founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview changemakers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 40,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Stay well and stay brave. Grain is an online restaurant that serves healthy yet tasty meals on demand and catering. They are backed by investors, including the Lo and Behold Group, T.E. Jia, Open Space, and Sento Ventures. Their meals are thoughtfully created by chefs with wholesome ingredients. For the month of April, Grain has teamed up with HGH Maimona to bring you a quirky yet delightful experience for the first ever Michelin-inspired catering in Singapore. Learn more at www.grain.com.sg. If you ever need to feed your teams or family, go check out Grain. Hey, morning, Valerie. Hi, Jeremy. Well, good to have you in person when we can. Yeah. Happy to come back here. Yeah. yeah. So we're talking all things Vietnam and a lot of things happened over the past month. Uh, a lot of big news that came out. So I think the big one that came up was the recent kind of like fraud and trial case that has been coming up. And to be honest, I know that's intertwined with some of the things that are happening in Vietnam right now, but I feel like I didn't really double click fully into all of the details. Could you share a little bit more about it? Sure. This is maybe South Asia largest fraud case in the entire history not just Vietnam. You know, the prospect was arrested in 2022, but I know you have been asking me about what's going on, who is she, why was she arrested for a long time, but I have been hesitating to discuss or share publicly. It's a very sensitive case, but now the trial is ongoing. Most of the information is public. I feel a little bit more comfortable to share to audience and discuss publicly mm-hmm. about what's going on. So the prospect is Trương Mỹ Lan. She's Vietnamese, but ethnically Chinese born and raised in Vietnam. She never went to college. She only finished her education in high school in Vietnam. But how she started out is she was selling cosmetic and beauty products in one of the largest wet market in Vietnam called Bên Thanh Market. Mm. If you go to Ho Chi Minh City, it's probably one of the first destinations that your tour guide will instruct you to go because that's probably the largest wet market and most important wet market in Vietnam in Ho Chi Minh City. So she made her first fortune from selling cosmetic and never went to college. I think when she turned 16, she met her current husband, who's a real estate property developer from Hong Kong. So Eric Chu is from Hong Kong, and he has a lot of strong connection from Hong Kong and as well as China. So they got married throughout the years of working together. They actually founded a group called Vat Thich Phat, and they slowly taking over the largest and most important real estate piece, mostly commercial, so including shop houses and office in the entire Vietnam, especially in Ho Chi Minh City. I, I know you've been to Ho Chi Minh City. If you walk around Nguyen Huệ Street, which is the most important street in the CBD area in Ho Chi Minh City. 100% of that street is actually owned by Vat Thich Phat Group. But I bet you that not many people know about this company mm, yeah. because it's 100% privately owned. They never publicly traded in any stock exchange. It's very elusive. And for Vietnamese, for me, who know some information about this company or this group, I only think that they are untouchable. Because they're so powerful. There's no way like they own most important and most expensive commercial real estate piece in Vietnam for no reason. So among us, we always think that they are untouchable. So when 2022, they were arrested and she was arrested, we were all dumbfounded. And, you know, we realized, oh, the untouchable are now touchable. And two years later, after she was arrested, now she is being on trial, including her niece 
and her husband are also being on trial. And the total fraud value is about 12 billion. But I actually estimate that the actual monetary effect is more than that. Mm -hmm. And it could add up to 10% of Vietnam GDP. And she was arrested for embezzlement of uh, bank fraud because she secretly through her shell company, which she had about a thousand or more shell companies, control and taking over ownership of a private commercial bank called Saigon Commercial Bank. I just call it SCB for short. And using this bank, SCB, to withdraw money illegally and finance her real estate ambition for Vạn Thịnh Phạm which is very unfair, right? Because there are so many other small, medium enterprises in Vietnam who want to be financed, but they couldn't. But she, using her shell company and bribery, the State Bank of Vietnam official, the yeah. former one, to let her control under shell company, right. this SCB. And effectively, she owned about 90% of this bank. Whereas banking regulation in Vietnam only allow individuals to own maximum 5% of any bank. So banking is very regulated in Vietnam, just like any other financial services companies in Vietnam. Foreign ownership, maximum for bank is 30%, whereas other industry like real estate, etc., 49%. Foreign ownership, only 30%. Individual, Vietnamese, maximum 5%. Other institutional, such as like pension funds or investment fund, 10%. So she, using her network, her bribery, and her shell companies effectively own 90% of this bank and withdraw money before the loan was even approved. And she has done that for years and she's on trial for fraud. But as I share, I think the real monetary value is more than that and it could be up to 10% of Vietnam GDP. And that's why we had so much economic uncertainty and I would say bit like the downturn last year leading up to this trial fraud case. So right now, State Bank of Vietnam and also other banking regulators are sitting together and drafting a new, I would say, tightened, stricter disclosure requirement for bank ownership. So there's talk that individual ownership will be reduced from 5% to 3%. And now there's more disclosure requirement for whoever owns at least 1% of banking. Before that, if you own 1%, you don't need to disclose. But now there's a proposal that if you own 1%, you need to disclose annually. Yeah. And I don't know if they will change the 30% foreign ownership limit as well. Overall, in summary, I think this is a short-term pain. It caused a lot of market volatility and investor concern about Vietnam. But whatever we are doing is for long-term gain, long-term financial transparency for a new market like Vietnam so that we gain more confidence under the international investor eyes. So short-term pain, long-term gain. Yeah, this actually is quite similar to the Chinese property dynamics that we have, right? We also have multiple areas in China who have gotten in house arrest because I think there's something interesting, you know, two parts of it, right? One is obviously you have an emerging market, then rule of law, relationships matter. When does that step into fraud and conflict interests and fiduciary duty is one side of it. But other side, I think is just that property in a communist state is also quite interesting. So one is to urbanize. So you need to build towns, cities, commercial, and you also have all land and all property fundamentally belongs to the state. So to some extent, you know, it's not like a private transaction where in the US, if I'm buying a freehold land, pretty much all land is freehold. So you buy all land from a private party, right? I think that's one aspect. Versus, for example, Singapore, 90% of land is controlled by the Singapore government, which is, you know, so it's also similar to China and Cuba, for example. And so a lot of transactions are developer, but also with the government, right? So I think there's an interesting, I would say like parallels and context to it. What other parallels do you see perhaps in Asia or beyond? I think the biggest parallel right now is the anti-corruption campaign. We really follow and see what's China, Chinese government is implementing. And, and yeah, I think our current political bureau is also making all the effort to clean up the corruption and bribery in the past and to clear up for a better future. And that's why, you know, under two years, we effectively arrested a lot of high profile ministers. I mean, former minister now, deputy prime ministers and even president. In less than two years, we changed president twice. It's a lot. I think we'll go into the second part there about the consequences of that. But you know, when you think about this in terms of at least the Vietnamese property side, how did it directly impact? Did it? I, I think you mentioned previously that there was like an interest rate hike. There's a lot of uncertainty around the loans that was tied to this. Could you share more about that? Because we were walking down the street and I was like, wait, you know, Vietnamese growth is growing so fast, but so many of these shops, the lights are off, right? Yeah. 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 So property 
if you know Vietnamese, like property is their largest, highest value asset. So when there's a drop in value for their real estate or property, immediately their psychology got impacted negatively. They feel like they don't have as much money as before. Yeah. Their wealth is reduced. They stopped all the spending. So consumption also got a hit because of that psychology effect because the house is their largest asset. And if effectively, real estate house and housing prices took a deep hit last year and it still hasn't recovered this year. I think the effect will prolong out because this is the correction in the bubble real estate. If you go to Ho Chi Minh City, let's say three years ago, two years ago, and look at an apartment in a small, less than 100 square meter apartment in Ho Chi Minh City, it's like more expensive than a mansion in Texas, for example. What's, yeah, what's the reason? It's clearly a bubble. So now, you know, we are correcting the bubble and the housing prices. People got scared. People got mentally affected. Yeah. yeah. I think it's not easy because again, there's a strong parallel of the Chinese side. But I feel like this is smaller and less painful than the Chinese yeah. side. Earlier, so I think honestly, I'll say points should be given to the Vietnamese government for stepping in earlier yeah. because I think the Chinese one really went a lot larger as a percentage of the yeah. GDP. So the pain and correction has been much worse, I would say. So, but I think it's interesting because it's the parallels, right? Because, you know, it's the classic dynamic where like property developer wants to expand. They want to get more liquidity because they need more leverage because to build a property, you need deposits from the customers, you need banking loans, you need other banks to join that initial bank loan. And then the problem, of course, is that when things go bad, then the implosion has a multiply effect. Financial system, right? Because so many people's like deposits, so many people's loans are connected to the banks. And then if the construction becomes the biggest non-performing loan on the bank's books, then they, you know, the banks will kind of freeze up because they can collapse, right? Technically, they're fragile in a way. So I think this is a right timing correction. It caused a lot of market volatility. But again, as a country, we cannot just depend or rely on real estate sector. Because actually, Q1 for Vietnam, we had a really remarkable growth. We grew, our economy grew 6% year on year in Q1 2024. And most of this growth did not come from real estate. This growth comes from manufacturing and tourism and domestic consumption. I think that's really interesting because I think, you know, we're kind of like going through the worst of it, I would say, right? So I think it's really interesting to see that economy change as well. Yeah, I think structurally we are pivoting away from heavily relying on real estate and diversifying, you know, manufacturing, tourism, as I mentioned, we had more foreign visitors comparing to before COVID. So really recovering and also consumption. It's about 60% of growth last quarter. You know, this is where we're talking a little bit about some of these political changes that happen as a result, right? So one of the news that came out this past month as well is that the second president who was supposed to be the successor to the previous one who was retired, and then this second one also resigned in about a year, so which was a big surprise. At least that's how I think the international media covered it. That was a surprise. I, I mean, it's not just a surprise to international community. As a Vietnamese, we, we were dumbfounded. We yeah. were all surprised by this resignation. It's our our second president got resigned in less than two years. So it doesn't look good on us in terms of under the landscape of political stability that we always pitch that oh, Vietnam has, you know, one party system much more stable than all the neighboring countries. So we were all surprised. But this is one of the, I guess, movement that belong to the blazing furnace anti-corruption campaign that our chairman Nguyen Phu Chok has been implementing since 2020. You mentioned about the blazing furnace anti-corruption yeah. campaign in a yeah. previous episode that we did together yeah. in brief. But could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. So our general secretary uh, Nguyen Phu Chok he's starting aggressively cleaning up the political system, banking, financial, and real estate company starting from 2020. So since then, there have been a lot of high-profile politicians who got arrested or have to voluntarily resign, like the former president, Vok Van Thuong. So at least two prime ministers, one deputy prime ministers, and many, many other ministers and local authorities. Can this correct and totally remove corruption and bribery from now on? I don't know. It's a very large system, and we are a bigger country than Singapore. Right. So it takes a long time to correct such a larger country and more people and more bureaucracy government as well. 
but it clearly signals that from now on, if you're in government and you attempt, you know, embezzle or corrupt, you have to think of the consequences that the previous generation that faced the consequences. I think there's a really fair point, and again, parallels to both Singapore and China, right? On the China side, the same anti-corruption campaign by Xi Jinping as well. So a big part of that corruption campaign. And obviously, I think the international media has seen it as both two ways, right? One is as good as anti-corruption, but bad because it seems to be placing loyalists or it's a power control dynamic and it always kind of like puzzled me a little bit because you know obviously if you are purging the system of people who are corrupt then obviously the people who replace them have to be more loyal to you right rather than loyal to themselves and i say this because i was working in china in the 2008 9 you know i had some exposure there as a student as well it was interesting because it was well known that people were corrupt in government right uh so it, 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 it's kind of like a weird thing where you're like people are like oh it's bad this anti-corruption campaign is happening I'm like no if, if even in 2008 like a normal person walking around hears people complaining that a government is corrupt then it's really bad for your electoral government legitimacy because as a government if you're supposed to represent the people whether it's a democracy or through a communist system but if you lose that trust or if people see you as corrupt but you're serving yourself rather than the state or the government or the whole country then things can really be quite problematic right and i think for the people's action party in singapore we actually have a similar dynamic now where it was founded very much under a very strong anti-corruption dynamic that's there and right now we have a minister iswaran currently going through a trial around uh, potential corruption right it's very tight i mean the amount of gifts they had was about twenty thousand. so yeah <laughs> so <laughs> So the it's like six charges for about 20,000, yeah. So, but I think the bar for the People's Action Party in Singapore is very, very high. It's pretty yeah. much like you can't take a, a Brompton bicycle. You can't take a bottle of whiskey. You can't take F1 tickets or hotel suites. So the quantum, obviously the total value is low, but I think it's more like the practice. So I think the People's Action Party is taking a very hard line on that. That's also came out in the past this year and I think the media has been a little bit kinder I would say because you know I think from their perspective it's not like a systematic thing that's one but two also I would say that they look at it saying okay Singapore's always been anti-corruption so this plays well to it so I think not much reaction from the economic yeah. international side so I would say in response to that I think we have two solution ish like first one is raising the bar higher like Singapore government and effectively pay politician more because I know politicians in Singapore get paid well and got really good benefits. Politicians in Vietnam, they get paid like 500 to 1,000 salary per month. But when you find out how much they actually own, they have like 100 billion Vietnam dong, which is like 100 million in USD in asset. It's obvious that they corrupted. So, but if they pay them well from the beginning, maybe they did. They don't have to attempt bribery or corruption at the beginning. But again, that's that will take a long time to actually implement. The second solution that I'm thinking about is to have more younger people actually in government. I know I have a few friends who are our age or actually younger, even like Gen Z generation who are starting to take position in government. They have to pass a really difficult exam to get accepted for a government job actually and they don't get paid much they get paid like I, like I say $300, $500 for just an official entry level official governor but they are so passionate and they are all educated in western school or education system right. like US, UK so they are more like progressive thinking and they are not as lured by money as the previous generation because actually they also come from really well-to-do family. So I'm seeing more and more of that like new generation in the government and I hope they can advance further in the political system so they will bring more transparency. That generation will be able to bring a positive impact and positive wave to our next generation of leaders. I think it's interesting because it's quite similar. The in recent Indonesia elections, Gita, brave co-host, shared in a recent episode. But, you know, the majority is Gen Z, who is really driving up vote changes uh, in the recent Indonesia elections and the Prabowo win, which was quite interesting. But also, it reminds me that in Southeast Asia, everyone's very young. Yep. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. There's not many boomers. The average age in Vietnam is 30 years old. Yeah, so everybody's yeah. on TikTok and everybody's on Instagram and, yeah. you know, some equivalent. So I think everyone's just digitally native in a very different way, right? And I think, you know, it's always forgetful because for me, I really love like US news. Yeah. And then so I'm like, oh, okay, everything works through that approach. And it's like, no, here everyone's really young. So talking about other kind of like geopolitics as well. I think a big one that we were recently discussing was the Cambodia Canal, which felt like you know, it was really important. So I think the big point of view, at least the summary, was that Cambodia wants to build a canal. So... What's the big deal? This is a big deal. So 
for the context, Cambodia and Vietnam have been like very large trading partner of each other, especially on Cambodia side. Vietnam is the second largest trading partner after China. So annually we trade about like at least six billion. And because Cambodia doesn't have their own canal system, all the trading import export activity have to grow to port in Vietnam in Mekong Delta. I'm not sure if you have been there, but it's called Cai Map, like a bit further from Ho Chi Minh City. So if they want to move goods out of Cambodia to South China Sea, they have to pass through Vietnam. So that's why Vietnam is very strategic, important for Cambodia. And that's why we have certain geopolitical influence to Cambodia. But Cambodia recently signed the project with China. It's a state-owned company, state-owned construction company in China. China agreed to build a canal project for Cambodia and the total project would cost about almost 2 billion. So if that canal is built, Cambodia doesn't have to go to the port in Vietnam anymore. So it will effectively eliminate all the trading and all the influence of Vietnam through Cambodia. And it will bring further importance of the Chinese government to Cambodia. If that canal is built, there will be a lot of other effects, such as most importantly, environmental. Because building a canal will cause flooding, salinity, intrusion problems to the Mekong Delta region, which is already facing a tons of climate change consequences. But Cambodia, of course, deny all of it. And it seems like they're moving forward with the construction because they have been measuring the canal system. Yeah, I think from Cambodia's perspective, a lot of it makes sense, right? I mean, first of all, the river is a big part of your internal trade network because you have roads and trains, but historically and also, honestly, from an economic perspective, the river is a big part of it. Then two is all your goods to get to the ocean for trade has to get taxed effectively by the Vietnam ports along the way. And then thirdly, geopolitically, if Vietnam decides to shut it off, and we've seen that happen in Europe, for example, like some of that trade or you can really be a lifeline, you know, kind of like strategic valve, right? That can turn on and turn off. And then lastly, we've talked about this in the past, but there's some military history around the control of the Mekong Delta as well between the Cambodia and Vietnam. Obviously, that's in the past now, but that's all factored into Cambodia's point of view, which is, hey, we need to have control in our own hands from their perspective, obviously, yeah. right? And China is like, hey, infrastructure financing. But also, I think it's quite similar because from China's perspective, it actually gives China optionality on the Belt and Road project they have. So China's really worried about the US blockading China imports through the Straits of Malacca and whether that's with the support or help of Singapore or not, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's this interesting dynamic where I think China's not only doing this, but they're also very favorable to the Thai Kra Canal, which is another, you know, and they're also building out trains in Thailand and they want a sponsor for Malaysia. But a lot of it has to do with like, how do we bypass trade? And you draw the shape that you have here. How do you bypass the Strait of Malacca and allow multiple routes through Myanmar, through Thailand, and through Cambodia, where Chinese goods can kind of bypass the Straits of Malacca and have three different potential routes so they can continue trading with India and Europe. So I think it's an interesting marriage of convenience for sure. Yeah. I think to your point about purpose of the canal, it's not just for trade and commercial. It's actually a way for the Chinese government to have more military base in Cambodia, in southern China Sea, so that if let's say what happened, they can react yeah. to that region more yeah. quickly. So it's a lot of geopolitical tension behind this canal, I would say. And the name of the canal is Funan Techno Canal. And if you look at the past, the Funan Kingdom, it used to be like Khmer Kingdom. That's how the Chinese call uh, Khmer Kingdom. And most of the Mekong Delta region did not belong to Vietnam before. Yeah. Vietnam moved downward to south and kind of gained control of this piece of land yeah. over time. But in the past, it's actually belonged to Khmer Kingdom. And that's why there's a lot of like resentment toward this uh, reliance of trade to Vietnam. And that's why I think the Cambodian really want to make this canal happen. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, it's yeah. a win-win for them, right? Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah, getting yeah. financing, you're getting construction, boost your strategic optionality, you get more trade. Like it's a win-win. So, But yeah, like you said, it's kind of like this love triangle. We always keep using it. Yeah. In Southeast Asia, again, it's under the Khmer regime, under Pol Pot. Then there was the Vietnam War of Cambodia. Then there was the Chinese-Vietnam War after the American-Vietnam yeah, War. <laughs> that was yeah. linked to that. And then, you know, it's all recent history, actually. I mean, it's yeah. only a generation ago, right? Yeah, so, not uh, even a generation ago. Like, yeah. that was the Chinese-Vietnam border war was in 1979. People still remember if you're in yeah. government today at the senior levels, you, you live through. So it's kind of like an interesting dynamic. And I think there's something that I've only become more 
appreciative over. You know, like the river goes through multiple countries, he has multiple issues, then everybody's all in that love triangle, war triangle, where everyone's just trying to balance each other out to reach some kind of like balance of force or parity or neutrality. It's not an easy uh, diplomatic game for sure. But yeah, with all of this construction, I think it will cause further climate effect to the Mekong Delta region, which is already in bearing of a lot of climate change already. The biggest is the salinity and drought. So the farmers have not been having like clean water for four months. It's usually they save clean water for two months and it will last them for the entire year. But recently the water has kind of polluted by the salt. Yeah. It's not possible for drinking or for like daily have a da- daily life activity. So they have to actually reserve water, clean water for yeah. at least four months. So this will cause further flooding, further like extreme drought and lack of like clean water for the Mekong Delta region. Yeah, uh, it's a big problem and there's so many things that contribute to it, right? I mean, like you said, the river goes through multiple countries, you know, from the top to the ocean. And so you have multiple stakeholders. That's one. And then two is everybody obviously is, you know, wherever your country upstream is, you want to take as much water as possible for your agriculture, for your water, your domestic usage. And then three, also I was reading that there's a lot of people dredging for sand so they can take sand from the mountains that in the river, do reclamation of their land. Actually, I have no idea whether this Singapore uses any of it. I think they do. <laughs> they do. They do. I'm I'm sure. Yeah. But yeah, so, and then that causes, like I said, that silt is needed because it's very fertile yeah. for the downstream farmers. And then Vietnam is obviously is the end of that river, right? Which is quite different from China, right? Because China has a, several very big important rivers, the Yellow River, for example. But it primarily flows through entirely almost all of China, the Chinese country. So there's a, there's not, a, there isn't a coordination problem between the various provinces because the federal government can step in. Versus I think there is some issues, for example, in the Indian continent, for example. Some of the rivers, are, there's some split control as well. Mm. Yeah, so we are fighting for geopolitics influence, but what yeah. about future generation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how are the Vietnamese farmers changing, right? So, you know, let's just say, you know, obviously rice farming historically is not very tolerant of salt. <laughs> I'll say that. You know, and then obviously historically it was used, you know, it requires the river to flood and not flood. You know, that's the whole point of rice paddies and stuff like that. So I assume that with the drying up or the reduction of the volume of the fresh water, you know, salt is going up from the ocean. But how are farmers adjusting or changing? I think I need to do another field trip. But for my last year field trip, I visited a few farmers in the Mekong Delta region yeah. and they are changing the crops. They are changing what the grandparents or parents grew. They are changing to higher value crops such yeah. as durian, such as macamedia nuts, yeah. because they have higher exporting values. But I don't know how sustainable that will be. Yeah, I don't know either. I know it's interesting because, uh, you know, I love my durian. Yeah. So this year is actually a record heat in Southeast Asia because of global climate change, but also the effects from La Nina and El Nino. There's a dynamic there. So I was just reading several times now, but the heat has been good for the durians. So they expect that the durian would not only be able to fruit earlier, but more regularly. So this year, supposedly, is going to be a bumper crop yeah. for durian. So yeah. in two months, maybe we have a durian party. <laughs> yeah, know? no, if they allow, I would love to bring more Vietnamese durian to <laughs> Singapore. Oh, no. I don't know if you want to start out geopolitical tension there. <laughs> you know, because it's Malaysian durian versus yeah. Thai durian versus Vietnamese now durian. Now we have Vietnamese durian, yeah. I, I, want, I wonder what the style is going to be. It's more party. like Thai style. More Thai style. Yeah, more Thai style. Okay, for those who don't know, the Thais don't let it ripen on the tree which is better for export, but it's not as good because it's hard to transport a fully ripe durian. So anyway, so that's interesting challenge. But yeah, you know, maybe next time we'll do a taste test. Uh, on that note, when you think about the, obviously a lot of folks are thinking about agri-tech, for example, in Vietnam, for example, I've met quite a few of them. Do you think that's a very large dynamic there or do you think that's going to be fundamentally limited by Vietnamese markets? I don't think the market side is a challenge or problem. I think the, the problem is we don't have enough like deep tech or actually hard technology startups to solve this like climate change issue. If you're only doing like loan channeling, lending, yeah. I don't think it's solve big enough share of the market. The real problem lies in how do we clean this water? How do we make sure we eliminate the yeah. salinity intrusion? I, I don't see any setup who can 
who come up with a solution for this. Yeah, I mean, it'd be pretty tough, right? I mean, yeah. you said requires governmental action, but the truth is the government action is dependent on Cambodians' <laughs> reaction to that as well. So it's not an easy piece. Yeah, I think historically, Singapore has done a lot of like desalination and a lot of water recycling and technologies. Yeah, that will be interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah. but that's also very hard tech and also very capital expenditure heavy. And historically, I think Singapore has also had its own challenges. I think Singapore's high flux currently has closed. It used to be the pioneer of desalination osmosis in Singapore and they're currently going through a court case right now after the wind up of it because again capital expenditure is very difficult but yeah so looking forward ahead as we wrap up this episode any thoughts or any key things that is on your mind or any questions that you're thinking about yeah so obviously I'm really excited about the growth of the economy and recover in Vietnam for quarter two I think this is a very important quarter and I'm hoping for more stability. We have an interim president, but we don't know who's the next actual president. So I hope we come up with an answer this year. Yeah. Or I think this quarter would be maybe too rushed, but this year, because things have to stabilize by 2025. That's the for, for investor confidence. So that's what I'm looking the most. Mm. And, and again, I want to reiterate, all of these are short-term pains, but for more long-term transparency, long-term stability, and long-term for Vietnam. For myself, I think the big question is through this as well is thinking through some of Vietnamese late stage capital. So I think about, we've discussed this before, but whether Vietnamese companies can continue to IPO, would that be in a local stock exchange or global stock exchange? That's something I'm kind of curious about whether we will see that window. Mm, I still don't think the option to go IPO internationally when they make like consecutive loss for years would be a viable route. I think Vietnamese entrepreneurs have higher bars and unfortunately we need to exceed investor expectation more than other countries because our interest or our capital is not as strong as maybe Indonesia. But yeah, that's just I think motivated the strong entrepreneur in Vietnam to perform better, to grow and still positive unit economics because there's an option to be listed in Vietnam if they are popular. Yeah. On that note, I'd love to summarize the three big takeaways from this conversation. First of all, I think we got to discuss very much the fraud case, uh, about $12 billion of fraud, but we feel like it's the tip of the iceberg. And so I think it was interesting to discuss the contextual history uh, of it in terms of the real estate piece, but also the parallels between China's property and the fact that the Vietnamese government is looking to stabilize, but also clean up the entire sector and its impact on the economy. The second thing that was good was we talked very much about the uh, political stability and the anti-corruption burning furnace campaign which again has parallels to the Chinese parties as well and we also got to talk about the dynamics of the recent political changes as well and what we're looking forward to ahead uh, lastly we got to discuss a lot about the Cambodia and Vietnamese uh, canal and the dynamics both from the history the contextual how it relates to the Chinese belt and road dynamic but also the impact on the environment for Vietnamese farmers as well on that note thank you so much for sharing thank you Jeremy and thank you brave audience Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.